Center. ACES stands for Agricultural Conservation Experience Services, in other words, gray hair. So I do have some, it just doesn't show really well when I'm not <laughs> without my hat. Um, now I am entomologist uh, without major portfolio. I told that to John, he said he wanted me to come and talk to you anyway. Uh, my day job these days, as it has been for the last 13 years now, is I am the uh, Minneapolis team leader for the Hennepin County Wetland Health Evaluation Program. So I take very nice people out and I throw them into swamps for fun and they seem to have fun and they come back with great data and they keep coming back year after year and they even came back this year. We figured out how to put volunteers out in a pandemic in Hennepin County, which was like jumping through 20,000 hoops. So those skills of that observation I've been putting to use as I've been standing here. I'd like to impart some of those skills to you all. So if you look around right now, you can probably see five species of butterflies. So you've got monarchs, you've got sulfurs, I've seen uh, Pyrrhus rape, which is cabbage butterflies, some little blues. They are all right now on the wing. This is the time of year when insects are on the wing. And what John asked me to come and do in part was to come and make insects great again. And I know that's really hard in a farming scenario to think of insects as great. I did my PhD on corn rootworm, and I think they're cute. I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> but, but they're not everybody's friend by any means. However, they do live in soil. And in fact, 90% of insects, we think, spend part of their life in soil. So. If I hold these things up, can people see them reasonably well? Okay, so just a little kind of background on this particular side-by-side. -side. When I was working in support of NRCS, we had a thing going on called the Soil Health Initiative, where uh, farmers would agree to plant cover crops, a mix, more than one species, it could be two, uh, in the same spot for several years and not to till it in the spring. That's it. So these two clods come from the same field. They're the same soil. They're the same field. And if any of you have been into an NRCS office this year before June, uh, July 1 when they flipped the calendar over, you will have seen these two because it was on the wall calendar. Also with this one. <coughs> So here are the two sides of the field. This was taken in November 2016 when we had that fabulous growing season. So on the very conventional sweet corn side, um, there is no structure to this soil. It looks like a brick. Uh, there are a few large macropores in it. Those were created by corn roots. The corn had been this so those roots had been ripped out of the ground and that left those holes. That was it. Over on the other side of the sweet corn field, you have all these roots of the cover crops. Those are the sort of light yellow. And then you have all the fungi that are growing, the white. So those fungi are busy doing several things. One is they're helping break down organic matter into the soil, make it available. Another is they're forming the internet of soil things that literally is connecting plants so that they can communicate with each other. This is something we didn't appreciate when I was a graduate student. And it was like, oh, got to have a good seedbed for my corn. And so we till the crap out of that field. We tilled it in the fall. We tilled it in the spring. We made seedbed. It was marvelous. And it looked like this later on. It did not ever look like this, which probably explains why I had such a hard time getting my research to go. I'll tell you about that in a few. So what we have here is a system that can talk to itself versus a system that is silenced. So the plants over here can say, uh-oh, I'm being attacked by an herbivore. I am going to start producing and secreting my defensive chemicals. And then the micro arbor, or I can never say this, mycorrhizal fungi uh, that are 
within and associated with that root system will take that knowledge, that chemical knowledge, and transmit it to the plant over here. So the plants over here that may not yet be getting chewed on by the herbivore may start producing those same chemicals to protect itself when it is chewed on by the herbivore. Because the thing between plants and insects is chemical warfare. Plants try to make themselves less appealing. Insects try to not care and to eat it anyway. So that's these two. I have these to help keep myself organized. Otherwise, I'd, I would literally wander off into the weeds and talk for three hours. So here we have some of the things that live in soil. It's not just roots. You can think of roots as powering the system. They are what is bringing that energy into the soil in the form of sugar and proteins and other things that are secreted into the soil as root exudates. So this marvelous goo that the roots are putting out there, the microbes right by the root roots are going nuts on that. The microbes are then getting eaten by protozoans. So here we go, bacteria, cyanobacteria, algae in your soil, also primary producers. Protozoans are in there feeding on things smaller. The rule in soil is if you are not food now, you will be food sometime. If you are small enough to get eaten, you will get eaten. Otherwise, somebody will wait until you die, and then they'll eat you then. Uh, you also have some unicellular fungi in soil, yeast. So if anybody has anybody here, I don't know how much this has been a problem for people, outside of the Twin Cities, because I live in Minneapolis. Have you been making sourdough? <laughs> <laughs> has, has anybody tried to make their own starter? Okay. That's where it came from. So our native yeasts are living in our soils, among other places. So if you have a really awesome sourdough starter, the chances are it, it came from the soil around you. Say thank you next time you have that perfect loaf. So another thing we get in soil, here's our bacteria. This is actually, before I, I leave this group, this is actually a streptomyces, so it's a member of the filamentous bacteria group, the streptomyces. They produce jasmine. Jasmine is the soil smell, the perfect, healthy soil smell. They produce it because they're trying to kill other bacteria with it. For, you, for us, it's wonderful. We can detect that at five parts per trillion. So we are like better than dogs at smelling that one thing. I always thought that was interesting. It means it's important to us as a species to be able to detect healthy, vibrant soil where there may be good plants for us to eat because we got started as hunter-gatherers. So here's the next group. We go into invertebrates. and This is what my specialty is is invertebrates. So here we have a picture of a nematode, but that nematode is having a very bad day. It has been caught by a nematode trapping fungus. And that fungus has a little contractile ring that once the nematode swims into it, and nematodes swim, they don't crawl. So if the soil is too dry, they cannot move. They swim on the film of soil water. Uh, the nematode has swum into that, and now it is being throttled by that, and it is being penetrated by that, and the fungus will soak all of the nutrients out of the nematode. So this nematode is being preyed on by a fungus. Here I've got uh, a higher insect, as we say, a fly. This is a seed corn maggot. Have an earthworm. I'm going to say this, although it is not soil health dicta. Most of the earthworms in Minnesota are invasive species. They don't belong here. So in a field, we like to see earthworms. We're happy to see earthworms. They're soil engineers. They're part of what's making our soil vibrant. In a forest, they are a nightmare because they are doing the same thing in forests that they're doing in fields. They turn the soil. They pull the organic matter from the surface down into the soil. Our trees did not evolve without that layer, that protective layer of leaf or needle, the duff. That's where their seeds drop into. 
So if their seeds drop onto bare ground, they may not germinate well. So I can say that earthworms are good right over here, but right over there, I may not want them because they're doing something different in the ecosystem there. This is a quick beetle. So you may know it better as a wireworm. Uh, its larva is a pest. Its adult is not. Here we have a predatory mite. There are also shredder mites. Got to get some, some snails. So here we have slugs. We have ants. And I included Goldie, Goldie Gopher because when we talk about who is living in soil, we also must include vertebrates because they do, they make homes in the soil. So when I'm thinking of soil, I'm thinking three-dimensional home. But it is also a three-dimensional home that for a lot of these things is less than 14 inches deep. So if I were to take a spoon and get a teaspoon of soil from this field, which looks reasonably good even though we're all standing on it, um, I might and send it off to a lab and say, please sequence this for me. And they would just sequence the DNA, and they would probably focus on the ribosomal DNA, or RNA rather. Um, the ribosomes are the parts of every cell that are responsible for clunking proteins together, one amino acid at a time. We know from studying their structure about how many different species might be in any given environment. In a really healthy soil, one teaspoon, that's one gram, may have 10 billion organisms in it. Most of them will be bacteria. They might represent 11,000 species. Do we know what they're all doing? No. We, do we know who they all are? No. Because we don't know how to separate them and culture them and study them individually well enough to learn all that. Can we say they're all there? Yes. But that's about as far as it goes at the moment. So when people are talking about microbial respiration, they're talking about a community whose members are not identified. So when you think about the soil, you've got this whole huge community of life that if you wanted to, you couldn't say thank you to individually because you don't know all their names. You don't know which one is needed to do what job. So it's a big black box that way. You can measure, in part, the job that they are all together doing. And that's about as far as our current knowledge will allow us to go. So focusing on bigger things, because bigger things you can see with your bare eye. When we talk about soil health, maximize diversity. More plants, healthier soil, more invertebrates, specifically insects. I took these three, three pictures at the Minokin farm in North Dakota. Wonderful place if you ever get a chance to visit it. So here you had flax growing with several other things, including cover crops. This is a cow flock. And here we have a, uh, a mustard being pollinated. Now, a couple things to note. Ecosystem service being shown here, lady beetles. Lots of them. This is six inches of height on a plant. There are two adult beetles there. A lady beetle is one of the hungriest things on the planet for aphids. A lady beetle's larvae are aphid destroyers. They will literally go along, pick one up, suck it dry, toss it. Pick one up, suck it dry, toss it. They hardly even bother to chew. They just walk along the leaf and they make a little line of death and destruction behind themselves. And then they poop out aphid parts and that's pre-digested so it's ready to go back into the soil and, and be nutrients again. So the more flowers, the more plants, the more different exudates are going down into the soil in any given system, the more predators you're likely to have. And our predators, our insect predators, are in real trouble these days. When I got here, I looked at my windshield and I looked at my front bumper and they were clean. I drove up from the Twin Cities. It's enough of a drive I'd expect there to be something on there. A couple of weeks ago, my husband and our youngest son were up in the Boundary Waters for a week canoeing. That's a long drive coming back. One insect. 
on the car. One insect. How many people can remember driving in the summer and having to wash the car after a long drive or having to, to stop because your windshield was getting so gross and you had to clean it off? Does anybody remember that? Because I sure do. That doesn't happen much anymore. Those large flying insects that we are used to, dragonflies, butterflies, all these sorts of things are in deep trouble. They're in deep trouble in part because of climate change, but they're also in trouble because we've been taking their habitat away. They need this stuff. They don't just live on the insect they happen to eat at that moment. They live in a complex habitat. So here, you can't really see them well. You've got the cow flop. On the cow flop are two different kinds of insects a fly and a dung beetle. Both of them are doing something that's really important for soil. They are laying eggs. They're going to lay eggs in that cow flop. The dung beetle, some species will lay eggs right in the cow flop. Others will make a ball, roll it underground, and lay their eggs there. The maggots and the beetle larvae will eat the poo. Not my idea of great food, but is theirs. And then they will make more poop. So you now have twice digested plants, super available nutrients, provided to and into the soil by these insects. So they are part of that nutrient cycling system, and a, a bigger part than I think we understand. And then we have pollination. So when I'm looking at the things that are flitting right now, some of them are laying eggs which means they are making little tiny herbivores for next year. Now you might look at that and say, no, I don't want that. But that's just part of the system. Those little tiny herbivores are going to feed the predators that are going to control the bigger insects that you don't want to see. It's a matter of who eats who when. The other thing that they're doing is they're pollinating. Because at this time of year when you have the most flying insect is also when you have the most plants flowering. That's a re there's a reason for that. They're connected. So the more insects we have on the wing, the better pollination services we get. So I said earlier that about 90% of insects spend their life, part of it, in soil. In this part of the world, that's usually going to be a resting stage, the winter. So you can overwinter as an egg in the soil. You can overwinter, in some cases, as an early larva, in other cases, as a pupa. But you're going to be waiting. You're not eating. Because there's nothing to eat in the winter. So if we disturb the soil in the fall, for instance, with fall pillage, you might think, hmm, OK, I'm going to till that cornfield where I had problems this year with rootworms, and that will mess up the rootworm eggs. Well, it will mess up two or three because rootworms have laid their eggs right by that root system. So you'll get some of those up in the air where they'll freeze, but others of those will get distributed through the top, say, foot of soil, however deep you're tilling, and they'll be down protected. So you're kind of putting a blanket over them with that and helping them survive the winter. So all of these insects here, I saw in one field, it was a field that had been converted from continuous corn, um, I think it was continuous corn for 100 years, 40 years before I got there. And it was put into a, uh, a prairie restoration. This is up by Fergus Falls. And there were three fields that we sampled that day. This was one of them. It was the prairie restoration. Then we had a, a field that had been uh, converted two years earlier into a pasture. It was mainly red clover at that point, but there was also uh, some oats, some wheat, various grasses trying to grow in there. It was kind of a happy mix, but mainly red clover. And then there was the cornfield, which had been conventionally tilled for over a hundred years. The cornfield looked amazing. I mean, we were there in July. This was big. Beautiful green. I never had a research field look that good until I got into it. Then I had a different viewpoint of it. All of these are flying around in the pasture area or in the a restored prairie area. 
So you've got some herbivores, you've got a white grub, here's the, the wireworm, the infamous black cutworm, which by the way is really good food for things that might be of interest to people, foxes even. Um, we have a predatory beetle larva, got a minor bee. So these bees were only found in the parts of that field that were not, those two fields that had not been killed recently. There were a couple of nests, which unfortunately some of our folks who were sampling discovered by digging one up. Uh, and there was a little bit of swatting and yelling that went around after that. But then here is the amazing, beautiful cornfield. Gorgeous corn. But well, one of my jobs when I was out with on um, projects like that was to measure bare ground. So I don't know if you can see it. How well can you see this picture? It'll be available for you to look at. There's something in the red circle. It's a soybean leaf. Now I was taking pictures of the cover, noticing that in the beautiful cornfield you had absolute destruction down the middle of the row. It was crusted, it was cracked, there wasn't anything growing there. There were a few areas that I looked at and thought herbicide failure over here, a few weeds coming up. And then I realized I had a soybean leaf. That soybean leaf was a year old at that point. It was still there. Soybean leaves are supposed to go poof because they're so high nitrogen. So that's supposed to be back into the soil almost instantaneously. It was there a year later. I didn't understand it. Then I looked at, at some of our data. There were no shredders here. So when our people dug up a cubic foot of soil to count the earthworms, they found one earthworm in a cubic foot of soil. By biomass in agricultural soils, earthworms are the biggest part of the invertebrate population. You could have about three or 400 in a cubic meter. So we had one, maybe two, depends on where they were digging. But it was nowhere near what you'd expect. So of course that was intact. There weren't any mites that we saw hopping around on the soil. We didn't have earthworms to pull it down in. There weren't any shredders. So it was going to degrade at the speed that it could out in the sun, out in the wind, out in the rain by whatever bacterial or fungal action could survive under those conditions. Obviously, it didn't work real well. So that meant that, that those nutrients were still locked up in that leaf. 